I'm going to introduce to you Reverend Willie Nevels, who is going to introduce our guest for today. Reverend Nevels. I'm pleased and much and privileged today to be able to introduce our speaker for today, for this hour. Uh, he is no stranger to me. Uh, him and I graduated together at that beautiful school, Lincoln High School, here in the great city of Wheat. He is none other than William Burris, who was born here in this city. Uh, his parents, William H. and Gertrude Burris. He began his postal career as a clerk in February 1958. And in the years that followed, became interested in union affairs. After gaining membership in the National Postal Union, <coughs> he began his ascension through the leadership ranks, fighting to improve conditions for postal employees. In 1981, Burris was elected as the executive vice president of the American Postal Workers Union, the second ranking officer in the 280,000 member union. In 2000, 2000, he was elected president of the union and became the first Af African American elected by the membership to the presidency of a major union. He served as president for 10 years before announcing his retirement after a 53 year career as a postal employee and elected union official. He is married to the beautiful Adele, his wife. They live in Upper Arlington, Maryland. I introduce to you my classmate, William Burris. Thank you, Ray, and thank you for that warm reception. Uh, it's good to be back home. I am Bill Burris. Uh, I'm referred to as Bill Burris now as a union official. Uh, my father was the Bill Burris of Wheeling, West Virginia. My sister, who was three years older than I, was named Billy Burris. So I was the third Bill Burris. So as I grew up in Wheeling, all of our friends, the gentlemen sitting at this table, referred to me as Buster Burris. So if you hear anyone refer to me as Buster Burris, they're referring to Bill. Uh, I am Bill Burris, and Wheeling, West Virginia is my home. Thank you for the invitation to return to this place that plays such an important role in my life journey. Now, the city has changed so much since I left. The world has changed. When I left Wheeling, there were no computers. There were no TVs, there were no jet engines. <laughs> the world was a different place. Uh, since I have departed, but it will always be my home. And I've traveled throughout the world representing postal employees. Uh, a number of countries, South America, Europe, Asia. The uh, Wheeling has always been my home. Uh, I present a special thanks to Sean for giving me this opportunity to share with you two books that I've authored. My Journey, and We Remember. Thank you very much, Sean. Thank you. My Journey, the first book, is a biography of my personal triumphs from meager beginnings in Wheeling to a successful career as a national union official. There are 54 unions in the AFL-CIO in the United States. Uh, I was the president of one of the 54 and the 10th largest union in the United States of America, and the largest representing a uh, single uh, employer. Uh, all of the employees that I've represented worked with the United States Postal Service. Uh, the American Postal Workers Union, of which I was the president, uh, represents uh, postal employees in 30,000 facilities throughout the country. Second book is We Remember, a book about the progress, the struggle, of African Americans in the United States from slavery to the presidency of Barack Obama. The journey that I traveled since I left Wheeling in 1954 uh, 
there were significant legal and social negatives associated with being a child of color in many areas of the country, including women. A race was perceived as descriptive of one's character and abilities. But over the span of my life, the world has changed, really has changed. This book is my record of the time and events as I passed through. And before anyone uh, thinks this may be directed at any group of people or any person uh, in the audience or in the country, uh, let me make it clear my feelings about my background in winning West Virginia and what has occurred in the interim period. My time in Wheeling was uh, difficult because I was a colored child, as I was referred to at that time. And things were different in colored children. We had less protection under the law. But what I have achieved over my lifespan, going from childhood in Wheeling to the presidency of a major union in this country, could only have happened in the United States of America. It could not have happened in any other country in the world. I've traveled throughout the world. And nowhere in the world can a minority succeed in achieving a position as I was able to achieve in the United States. So despite the struggles that I uh, challenged, that challenged me over the course of my career, particularly the, the, the early years during the period I was in with it, I'm very thankful for being a citizen of the United States of America and all that it offered me in terms of my career. When preparing for retirement after a 53-year career as a postal employee and union official, I was determined to record the events of my life that inquiring minds could learn of the decisions and the people involved in my ascension from a child in the hills of West Virginia to the presidency of the 10th largest union in the country. And as Willie indicated, I became the first and only person of African-American descent in the history of this country to be elected by the membership to the presidency of a major labor union. Through that position, I became a vice president of the AFL-CIO, the umbrella organization for all unions in this country. And I know the president of the Steelworkers Union, president of the Coal Miners Union. I know them personally, and they have a big footprint in the community of Woodland West Virginia. Through the position of president of APW, I became a president of the AFL-CIO and of the International Union of Workers Throughout the World. I traced the road taken in my journey through my years of adolescence, including foster care for several years in the Ohio Valley, moving from community to community and returning to them at age seven. I lived in Bel Air, I lived in Toledo, I lived in Indianapolis. I lived in a number of communities in the foster care in the uh, uh, Wheeling community. In the years that followed, after my return to Wheeling, in addition to the normal activities maturation, I would be employed as a paperboy of the Wheeling Intelligence <laughs> at Horn's Department Store. I worked there with my father as a janitor. And at Fulton National Bank, where I elevated at the age of 16 to be the only custodian in the bank. A full <laughs> bank is no longer there. Now I drive by and I can remember the days that I, I had a key to the bank at the age of 16 when I was a junior in high school. Uh, and I would go there and open it in the morning, do the cleaning, leave there and go to school, play sports after school, and then go back to the pool to finish the cleaning for the day. Uh, I also worked in my parents' newsstand on Chapel Street, directly across the street from the Pythian building. The location is now incorporated into uh, the properties of Coppicing the Senior Citizens Park. My family owned a uh, beauty salon and newsstand uh, right there opposite the Pythian building. And I uh, worked there in the evenings as well, assisting my parents in running the newsstand. All of my friends would come by and get free, uh, <laughs> free <laughs> magazines and candy and cookies and a few of them, even a pack of cigarettes. <laughs> in May of 1954, I departed Woodland to join the United States Army. I was unsure, and I called Son to find out whether or not I left Wheeling from the public library, the 
the recruitment station for the United States Army. But I, when I drove through town yesterday, I recall that it was really at the courthouse. I left Whitting from the courthouse uh, here in Whitting, Virginia, and terminated my citizenship in the community. Uh, my parents relocated to Detroit while I was in the service, so when I was discharged, I did not return to Whitting. I had no relatives <coughs> residing, remaining in Whitting, so, and I did not want to go to Detroit, so I went out on my own in the world to make my life whatever it would become. I began employment in the Cleveland Post Office, Cleveland, Ohio, where I engaged in union activities, leading to my election to the presidency of the largest postal union in the world, representing postal employees in every community in the country and its possession. Every place there is a flag, an American flag, there is a postal employee, an employee that is a member of the American Postal Union. And I did not represent letter carriers. So before you tell your letter carrier you met the <laughs> president, I did not represent letter carriers. There are four unions in the post service. Letter carriers is one, the rural letter carriers is another, and the union that I represented, the American Postal Workers Union, represents the clerks that sell the stamps, the ones that do distribution distribution in the back rooms, and the maintenance employees and the drivers. As context for my perspective of life in Willie and the background for the story of my journey, my beginnings, I was born in 1936 in a house on 12th Street with parents William and Gertrude. And until leaving in 1954, with the exception of two years in foster care, various cities, I, I lived, I started school in Gravel Hill in Delaware, Ohio, and uh, then returned to Willie. Uh, in the first grade, <laughs> and, and, uh, I have a, a good memory. I've always had a good memory. And, uh, I recall, I used that memory to, to, to prepare my book. But I was thinking back on uh, that period of my life. I, I recall vividly the deep discussion my father and others were having when I was beginning to go to school. I was born in December, so uh, I was at the cusp of whether or not you can start school at the age of four where you have to wait until you're five. They didn't have the half years at the time. So I recall them having a serious discussion of whether or not they thought they would keep me. I was four years old and they were going to enroll me in school in Wheeling. And they were uh, on the verge of getting a free babysitter. <laughs> and my mother and father had separated. My father was taking care of us and he was having a difficult time placing us, having people take care of us while he worked. So they were worried that maybe the school would not enroll me at the age of four. And uh, they took me off to the school and to their good fortune, the school kept me. So I started school at age four. And when I, I became a senior in high school, I had just turned 16 uh, when I entered uh, school for my senior year because I had started so early. So I was a, a year behind all of my <laughs> compatriots here at the front table, and they were all over the place as I was going through school. Uh, with the exception of those two years in foster care, I interacted daily with the citizens of the Whitting community, uh, living on High Street and Oak Street. I don't think either of those communities uh, exist today. I drove up there a couple of years ago, and it looks like the forest, is, the woods have taken over that section of the city. I attended elementary school in Columbus, Bel Air, and Toledo before returning to Wheeling while in the third grade. And for grade seven and eight, I attended Blessed Martin High School. Uh, I went to the Catholic. My father was always trying to find a niche in life for me, trying to find something that I could do well uh, unsuccessfully. He was trying. So for age seven and eight, he uh, impressed upon me that he was going to enroll me in Bessie Martin. He thought he was providing a better education than Lincoln. So from seven and eight, uh, I went to Bessie Martin. And I had an excellent experience at Bessie Martin. The nuns were very, very good, uh, very compassionate. Uh, they, uh, I didn't understand. While a block away, there was another Catholic Catholic school, and uh, uh, it was reserved for boys only, and the Blessed Martin had boys and girls. Uh, I didn't understand that at the time, but 
But uh, I finally impressed upon my father that I wanted to play football. That's a part did not have a football team. So I transferred back to Wheeling in the ninth grade. My life in Wheeling was influenced by the separation of races in the houses, where we were herded into areas dominated by people of color. I, I lived on O Street, High Street, and there were no, they were all African American communities. There were no uh, Caucasians in the community at all. So as I grew up in the Woody community, I never knew a Caucasian other than as connected with my work. Uh, we were to, it was like living in two countries. Uh, I lived in the country in a small community, 60,000 people. But I could walk down the street and it could be somebody living three blocks away. I live High Street, as you know. I don't know if Grandview is still there. Yeah. Grandview was just the next street above High Street. And Grandview was public housing that I'm sure my family would have qualified for. We were not permitted to live in Grandview. But I didn't know a single person on Grandview. Not one. It was all Caucasian. High Street was all African American color. So we were in two different worlds. We attended different churches and schools, played on different playgrounds. And during the war, we were denied admittance to the movie theater. You, you just can't imagine for a 14 or 15 year old child, or 12 or 10, uh, realizing that they're not permitted to enter a public building because of the color of their skin. So not because of uh, the way they acted, not because of their intellect, not because of their income, not because of the values that they hold, but merely because of the color of your skin. Uh, during the war, we were denied admittance to the movie theater. Couldn't go to the movie theater before the war. I remember we would go to the movie to watch, see our action heroes. And I thought, uh, you know, I was eight, nine years old before the war. And I thought if I went to the movie, I might see my father, because he, he was in the military. And I would see him killing the Japanese. But I couldn't go to the movie. I had to walk to Bridgeport. We walked across the bridge and go to Bridgeport to go to the movie. And if we wanted to roller skate, we were restricted to Monday's only. We couldn't go to roller skating at the roller skating rink. And it was a major form of entertainment, except on Monday. But it was here in Wheeling that I matured as a human being and developing the foundation of who I was to become. The government of the United States and the state of West Virginia officially embraced the assumption that color determined one's right to the rewards of full citizenship, not finding income and employment, not effort, not education, not family structure, but the color of one's skin. It was believed by many we were different, and our color was a determining factor. We were different because, we, because of our color. Somehow, that changed what happened in our minds, what happened in our heart, what happened in uh, all the reasoning that we applied to living from day to day. Throughout the years of living in Wheeling, uh, I was never called a nigger at least not to my face. But I am no fool and I'm sure that the offensive word will be used routinely in anger and in normal conversation by many in the Willie community. As we progressed through the changes of the civil rights struggle in the 60s and witnessed the demise of the white privilege, after 50, 400 years, mine was the last generation to be denied public accommodations except for water fountains and restrooms, denial of service at public venues, separate seating on public transportation, refused reservations at hotels and restaurants, and the right to vote. Mine was the last generation. My memory of Louis Hot Dog Restaurant, two blocks, several blocks from this library, was that I could not be seated and was forced to make purchases through the window. Likewise, the colored library was on 12th Street, just below my house. So other 
So this is the first occasion I've had to visit this public venue. Uh, it was not in this location, but there was a living library during the period that I spent in living, but I was not permitted. Uh, I was directed to uh, partake of the library on Torre Street, uh, which was the colored library. In the pages of my journey, I capture for the reader the irony that after generations of struggle, when the barriers to equal education were removed on May 27, 1954, it was just 12 days before I graduated on May 29th. So on May 17th, 12 days before I graduated, the Supreme Court of the United States said separate but equal did not pass the constitutional muster. And the, the schools had to be integrated. Those of you that lived in that period recall that uh, in 55, the governor of West Virginia came forward and gave the students a choice. In 55, the students had a choice, either returning to the segregated school or, or uh, enrolling in the integrated school, getting high. Uh, in 56, they integrated all education in the state of West Virginia. Now, unlike Virginia, Virginia fought it for 10 years and closed all of their public schools you know, instead of integrating. They really refused to do it in Virginia. And one of the oddities is in the state of West Virginia, uh, the West Virginia Constitution had a provision that, and I quote, that included that white and colored persons shall not be taught in the same school. That provision was not removed from the Constitution, was not repealed officially until 1990. Mm. 46 years after the Supreme Court decision, it was still there, even though schools were fully integrated between 1954 and 1990. That offensive provision still remained in the West Virginia State Constitution that white and colored persons shall not be taught in the same school. The court decision, the Supreme Court decision, was too late for me because even though I was the recipient of the Stifle Prize, I was awarded the Stifle Prize each year of my high school. I was either the first or the second top student in my class. But despite the fact that my grades were good, uh, I could not be a, I could not attend any of the local colleges in the Whitting area. Uh, I would have loved to have gone. I wanted to be an engineer, an architect. My father could not afford. My older sister was attending the West Virginia Colored School in Blueville, West Virginia at the time. He could not afford two uh, of his children with the room and board that would have been required if I were to have attempted to go to West Virginia as well, West Virginia State as well. So I ended up enlisting in the United States Army. And that opportunity that otherwise could have been presented as being an architect, an engineer, a lawyer, a teacher, if you will. Uh, that path to success, my path to success, uh, uh, had to be in places where I had never been, among people I never knew, doing things I had never done. It had to be somewhere other than my home, really much cheaper. <coughs> My journey is a recording of those years in obscurity that led to the opportunities that were afforded to me to represent the interests of millions of postal employees. And successfully, I was able, on the, during my leadership of the union, I was able to increase the salary of postal employees from $18,000 per year to $55,000 a year. So hundreds of thousands of millions of postal employees that were able to send their children to college to purchase home, to live the middle class American life on my watch as a leading representative of postal employees in their union. As president, uh, I was fortunate to be included in Jet Magazine for seven consecutive years as one of the most, one of the 100 most influential African Americans. Point of pride for me. Uh, my picture, a bio, appeared in Jet Jet Magazine for seven consecutive years that I was one of the most 100 influential, most influential in the United States. It gave me the opportunity to travel throughout the world 
and meet one-on-one -on -one with four American presidents. I've met four presidents, have they had the opportunity to shake their hands, to be one-on-one -on -one conversation with them about world events. And I had the privilege and uh, opportunity to meet Nelson Mandela in the same fashion. Uh, we shared the same space, had the opportunity to share a few words. And I, uh, as Vice President of the APW of our union, I sent seven of our representatives to South Africa to be, to be witnesses in his election when he was elected as President of South Africa. And they were monitors of the election. And if you recall, uh, that was a turbulent period of time where <coughs> Congress passed uh, legislation to put pressure on the South African government to end apartheid. And President Reagan at the time vetoed it. I was arrested the only time in my life you know, I've been around it. It was picketing the South African embassy in Washington, D.C. But uh, having the opportunity to meet with four American presidents and my wife's uh, brother is a minister, has a large church in Washington, D.C. And the Obama family has come there to worship on two occasions. So I've had the opportunity to meet them in that environment as well. But wherever I was, I was a product of William West Virginia, my home. And a representative person was in the greatest country in the world. And as I said at the outset, my journey, this book, my journey, could only have happened in the United States of America. I could not have come from a position of minority status in any other country and achieved what I was able to in the United States. So I'm most appreciative of my beginnings in Wheeling, what it instilled in me as background and prepared me for uh, the struggles that I was to face in the remainder of my life. Uh, and that, is, that journey is included in my journey. Uh, I uh, struggled over it for about eight months uh, in the basement of our home, trying to recall all the uh, ventures that I had gone through, uh, beginning in Wheeling and progressing through in my career as a union representative. Uh, I also wanted future generations of the Burns families and every audience that I've spoken to about my book, I've encouraged those in attendance that everyone should write down points of their life. The next generation should have your first-hand record of how you live your life. They should not be left with just faded pictures and the memory of others and relatives of who you were and what you went through. Everyone should take the time. Now, we all are authors, but we can write down before we uh, leave this earth uh, important matters that we went through as human beings on this earth so that the next generation will know our story. Uh, and that was what was behind me. I wanted future generations of the Burris family to know what my life was like. I didn't want them to rely upon a relative or someone else to tell them about me. I wanted to tell them about me myself. And I encourage everyone to take the time. If it's just a recording, uh, if you don't want to write it out, just a recording and talk into the microphone and tell the world, tell future generations of your family and inquiring minds, future inquiring minds, uh, what your life was like some of the hurdles you will between, joy, and don't leave it to uh, pictures that are no longer discernible in memory of others, some family member or uh, some uh, cold statistic on Ancestry.com that says when you were born and when you died, it doesn't say anything about you. So I encourage all of you to take the time to just record a few events in your life so others that follow you at that time will come. I'm, I'm 78 years old now. I'm hoping I've got 178 more years. But whatever it is, you know, at some point, there will be inquiring minds who wonder about how I spent my life, uh, what I did. I've got, I had four children. And one is now deceased, but I've got three left. And they have children. Uh, they would be looking back to their heritage, where they came from, 
uh, what their grandfather was like, what type of person he was, what did he do, where was he from, and you can bet your bottom dollar that at the beginning of the book, uh, I tell them uh, I'm the son of Willie West Virginia. This was my home. The second book is We Remember. It's the small book here. And it is intended as a tribute to the millions of human beings who engage in the struggle to achieve the quality of this country, a country for whom they had given so much over such a long period of time, millions of human beings. And we know more about the Holocaust than we knew about the 400 years of struggle that Africans experienced from the first slave to the election of Obama. I explained the origins of Black History Month and the roads traveled to arrive at this place in our history, tracing the inhumanity of slavery and discrimination imposed on generation after generation. From the first recorded slave, I can guarantee you that nobody in this room know the name of the first recorded slave. His name was John Punch. The first African was dead. Seven in the New World, the United States of America, were not slaves for almost 100 years. They came with other travelers, and many served periods of intentory service for passage. They would guarantee their service for a period of time to pay for the passage from their home country to the United States, but they weren't slaves based on the colors of their poor life. They could buy their way out of slavery. They could work their way out of slavery. But John Punch was the first recorded individual in this country that was a slave for life based upon the color of his skin. I inform in the book that the history of slavery reveals the fact that the early settlers did not separate by race over time. There was intermarrying, uh, there were people back and forth. Uh, however, it grew to become an insidious and cruel subjugation of millions of human beings. We remember, <coughs> is my attempt to put our path to equality in a personal perspective and pay tribute to those who struggled for so long for the progress achieved. Uh, I researched uh, my great-grandfather, Ancestry.com, which is learning something about my family, where they came from. And uh, the closest I can get is my great-grandfather, uh, my great-great-grandfather before the Civil War, uh, names William Burris. And slaves during the period did not have last names. They were known by their first name only. So he had a first and last name. So I'm assuming, I haven't found the record yet, but I'm assuming that he uh, was not a slave at the time of uh, the Civil War. So uh, uh, I tried to record in We Remember the struggle of millions of oppressed people who lived and died and left their mark. I mean, each generation generation after generation after generation, with no hope, just try to move forward with very little hope, generation after generation, that was uh, relegated to be slaves of their generation as well as the one to follow. Uh, my generation is like the last horse of bricks in a 20-foot high wall. My generation. We were at the top. My generation, the civil rights laws were passed in the 60s as we were maturing, and all of that struggle that occurred by the generation previously uh, had been, uh, were worth it. The formal education system did not tell the whole system the story of slavery. So we have learned little of our past. We have learned little about the lynchings, the rapes, the tearing away of children to never see their mothers again. The denial of due process in their lives were at the whim of drained individuals. There was no protection by the state, no protection whatsoever. And I try to capture that in the book that the state did not provide any protection. And you can imagine the pain and the indignity to be stripped naked and braided before buyers as commodities, no different than a horse or a cow or a dog. We celebrate Black History Month that we can learn the truth. And move the book to appreciate how far we have come and put into perspective how far we have to go. 
Our rival was in chains for slaves to serve white America, and over a period of 40 years, we struggled with sacrifice. One day at a time, one generation over another. We, of the African American community, and we've gone through the various names called names, and I capture that in the book as well. Uh, we were called niggers, negros, uh, coloreds, uh, African American blacks, and uh, we've gone through a whole litany of words used to describe who we were as people. We do not want, know what we went through to make Barack Obama the president of the United States. Uh, we have very little of that history, but uh, we have progressed to the point that we, and many of us never believed we lived to see the day when an African American would be elected president of the United States of America. Black History Month is a time of reflection. February of each year, that we can look back to all the suffering that our ancestors endured to get us to this point. We learn about the suffering, the separation of families, the killings, the torture, the rage, the denial of due process, and the indignity of being treated less than human on the basis of skin color. We have much to be thankful for to those who paved the way, and despite our daily challenges, we are light years ahead of where we were. So background, Black History Month was established in 1926 by Carter Whitson, a native of our state, our home state, West Virginia. Uh, he was the origin of Black History Month, and he convinced President Gerald Ford to then to designate the month of February as a time to honor our journey from enslavement to <coughs> president. John Punch, the first slave for life, it was an unusual circumstance that he became the first reported slave for their life in the United States. He and two other slaves, the other two were Caucasian, uh, ran away and they were caught and were put before the courts to be punished. Uh, the two Caucasian slaves were given additional period of slavery, but the judge ordered that John Punch, based upon his skin color, would be a slave for life. That was his punishment for running away. And from that point forward, uh, children, uh, uh, no matter their status, if they were of color, uh, they were slaves for life. Uh, and one of the odd things about what I try to capture in the book about the slave for life standard that was imposed in the United States was uh, the United States, a new world, was uh, populated primarily by citizens of Europe, the old country. And the practice in those countries was that a child followed the status of the father. The father set the status for every member of the family given the last name, and the status of the father became the status of the child as well. He didn't follow uh, the Jewish community had a different standard, but the old world, uh, they, uh, when they instituted slavery in the United States, they had to change that because uh, <coughs> it was not the father that determined the status of the child. Even though they passed laws, there would not be any interaction or any intercourse between the slave females and the male uh, freemen uh, that occurred anyway. And there were children born from that union. And those children, uh, because they were of color, no matter who their father was, their biological father was, they became uh, slaves for life. They, even if they were, were raped by the overseer, then the offspring of that rape would be a slave for life. I try to explain that in the book. And they even passed laws at the time imposing serious fines to any white male that had sex with a black slave. Uh, that did not prevent the intermingling of the bloodlines, as you can see by nobody in Africa is not color. 
<laughs> they had to act in some way. <laughs> we, had, we are of, of the rainbow of colors. We go from, you can't tell the difference between African American and Caucasian to the very, very dark. And look like African, but you can see. My human did not come because I came to the United States of America. It came because at some point along the line there was intermingling of the genes in the blood. And this subjugation of human beings continued for 250 years, one generation after another. And after participating in the bloodiest war in the history of this country, state by state, laws were initiated, Jim Crow laws. And some of those were passed in the state of West Virginia, my home. <coughs> Even after slave state experienced total defeat in the Civil War, and West Virginia you know, was created as a result of the Civil War. Play, but they not, you know, there was high debate within the state. Wheeling was a major point of contention, contention in those discussions. Uh, they had a constitutional convention here in Wheeling uh, at the point where they broke away from the state of Virginia uh, not to declare war on the, on the Union and the United States of America. And, uh, but uh, there was still a lot of sentiment in the state for the slave owners and uh, they were torn, the king was torn between the two. So after the war was over, they embraced, embraced many of the Jim Crow laws that were intended to to create that separation between the two. Uh, and we, I try to capture it in the book, how we went from there to here in terms of interaction of race as a citizen of the United States. And I, I watch, I watch, watch with, uh, not humor, but uh, some concern about how we got from there to here. And uh, there were laws passed in the 60s, Civil Rights Act, uh, the Voting Rights Act, there were three or four uh, legal hurdles that were overcome to make us uh, equal. But uh, the killings of the four children in Birmingham, the march across the bridge from Selma to Montgomery, uh, television uh, played a significant role in the freedom we were able to achieve the equality that occurred over time because those vicious acts that were occurring throughout the country were no longer isolated. They were being throughout the world. And people of good heart in this country were able to see the beatings the fire hoses, the rapes, all, all the indignity uh, perpetuated upon human beings, the killings of him killed. You know, his mother demanded that his casket be opened so the world could see what they had done to inside. And those hastened uh, the integration of American citizens, no matter their color, as much as the laws did. The fact that people could see the brutality of separation and segregation. So, we have come a long way from the time that I was in the state of West Virginia, that I was in Wheeling, and had the opportunity to interact with many of you. Unknowingly, uh, we didn't know each other, because I said, we lived in different worlds. We lived in one, I lived in another. And, uh, This community nurtured all of us. And we were going to want to live productive lives in many other fields, uh, no matter how we uh, began. And the proclamation that all men are created equal now has real meaning. It has meaning that we have the opportunity to live out our lives uh, equal based upon our abilities and our contributions uninfluenced by the color of our skin. And the, the, the battle's not over. There's still things to be done. It's not completely eradicated yet, but we've come a long way. And as I said at the outset, it could only have happened in our country. You know, we in West Virginia, uh, in the United States of America, uh, gave me the opportunity to be what I was. And uh, I've been successful 
blazing the path in this lifetime that I can be proud of, that my family can be proud of, and that we can be very appreciative, not only of the struggle we went through, but where we began, and the contribution that it made to the ultimate goal. So thank you very much. Uh, I invite you to read for yourself. Uh, I try to record these events. Uh, the, the day to day activities, the struggle, the learning, the imagination, the experiences, uh, they began for me in the real community. Uh, we're advanced through my service in the United States Army and in my own career as a postal employee with no high uh, My sister, uh, we lived on high street, and as I said earlier, my father wanted us to get experience a lot of different things and it's given us opportunity to go forward and like no matter the distractions. Uh, he sent her to school in Bel Air. We had been in foster care in Bel Air so we had an address. And she went through uh, two years to high school in Bel Air. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, John Havlicek was uh, going in class in school at the same time. And uh, my father asked me, what about going to Bel Air? Daddy, I'm not getting up an hour early. Just to go to school. I have to go to school with white people. I'm not getting up an hour early every day. I walk around here. She walked. She went across the bridge every day to go to school. And, you know, she came back to Lincoln for her senior year. But uh, she, 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 I'll get to that later on, and I did. I did, you know, later on in life. Uh, I was able to. But uh, it's been an experience, and I'm most appreciative of where I began. And this is my home. I've been in Japan, China, France, and England, and people ask, Where are you from? I was proud to say, I'm from West Virginia. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Do you feel as though that uh, 
with the South and slavery has been romanticized to a point where people don't realize that slavery was more like Nazi Germany and that the plantation was more actually forced labor camps. Well, that, that occurred, of course, labor came after slavery was exonerated, after it was abolished. Uh, uh, the abolition got rid of official slavery, but after that, they imposed a different type of slavery. Well, sure. labor came. Sure. They would get share property. That's, that's how they imposed slavery after the Civil War. And for, for years, 50, 60 years, they imposed official slavery, forced labor camps, and uh, they would, some person would say that you owe money. And even if you didn't, that would enslave you to the ship to pay it off. One more thing. Uh, why is the history been told about the million people or millions of uh, slaves that died, well, free people that died between 1865 and 1872. There's a book by Downs called A Sick Freedom that outlines that a million, there's four million slaves were uh, 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 free, freemen. And within uh, seven years, one million of these people had uh, perished, either due to starvation, sickness, or even hunted down and killed. Uh, this is part of the history that no one talks about. Uh, they say it's the greatest biological disaster of the uh, 19th century, but no one ever hears about it. Yeah, well, we, we live in a democracy. And history reflects what the people demand. And there are just some people in this country who are making the demand. People complain, they criticize, but they don't make a demand. And we can elect individuals, politicians, who fulfill our needs, uh, or we get rid of them, we get others that will. But uh, it's the apathy among the citizens that don't insist upon correct history. They're going through this debate presently <coughs> about Common Core. We're talking about changing the educational system to a new standard called Common Core. And the American public is not engaged in that. These politicians are engaged in that debate. So it's just a question of the citizens. Well, one, not the, one more thing. Uh, in the 1990s, Bill Clinton uh, put forth a bill to Congress to apologize for slavery, and they refused to pass the bill. Uh, what does that tell you? There's a concern about reparations. There's a concern about that what will follow was the demand for reparations. So there is resistance, and there will be resistance to any official uh, act by the government to atone for what happened over those 40 years. Because they are concerned the next step would be that there will be payment associated with that. So that's, that's the issue. Yes, I was privileged to teach a historically black college in Savannah, Georgia, for a number of years. And many of my colleagues still came to segregated schools because Savannah was very slow in integration. And I learned through them that they had had, and this is not a defense of segregated schools, but they certainly were privileged in their own education and had many well-educated and dedicated teachers in the black schools. And I wonder if you, and I'm a teacher, so this is part of the question, uh, if you could comment on the, the faculty, the staff that were in their day. One of the um, things that uh, if I'm going to, if I'm to write another book, it will probably be the, uh, about the assimilation of black teachers. I've never looked into that. We had teachers in Lincoln and that I respected very much. I don't know what happened to them. I know what happened to these gentlemen sitting here. They were my classmates, and I know what, where they went. I don't recall. I heard by word of mouth what happened to some of the teachers, but I don't know how they assimilated the principals and the teachers, but we had an entire system in the state of West Virginia. It was all black. You know, you had the custodians, you had the teachers, you had the principals. Uh, so I don't know what happened to them. Did, were they absorbed into the overall system? Did they retire? You know, I, I've never read a book about that, and uh, I would be interested in finding out. But uh, we had we had good teachers that I respect. Uh, I uh, and looking back. They never talked to me about Brown versus Board of Education. <coughs> there were controls, there were limits on what they taught me as a child. 
I, I did not get the full range of education that I think I was entitled to, and it was because of the segregated system. No, no. I was, I was unaware that Brown was being considered, that integration was on the table, and I was a top student in my class, and I was unaware that they were considering integrating all schools in, in the state. So while I respected my teachers, I, I was either the first or the second student in my class up through my senior year. And uh, upon graduation, we prepared for graduation, uh, the two, the, the person that had been salutatorian, I mean, salutatorian, valedictorian, uh, and I had to write a speech. And we uh, had to write it and then record it, memorize it, so we could give it on uh, graduation, at the graduation. So I wrote this speech, I guess maybe 10 pages. Pretty long. And I had to memorize it and present it to the teacher. And because she was very, our, our English teacher, she was, everybody would tell her, she was something. But uh, I, uh, they gave us the grades right before we graduated, right before we got our diploma. And they had had two other students to tie me. They had to manipulate the grades so we were all tied. I mean, they had to go back, they had to adjust the grades for an entire year. They had to make the last grade so that our grades would be even, me and two other students. That had never been valedictorian or salutatorian in their whole system. And about two weeks before we graduated, one of the teachers said something to me, and I responded, I was getting out of school. You know, I could do say whatever I want back to him. And I did. <laughs> he said something to me that was out of place. And I said something back to him that was out of place. So I suspected that they went back and in retaliation they were going to adjust the grade. So I would tie with the other two students who had never been there. And when they told me about it, I told them, well, I'm not giving a speech on that place. You better get in. They're going to give one third of that speech. They will tie and get some of my money. <laughs> I forget what the amount was, maybe $50, $75, something like that, but I'm not going to do a speech. And they will share my money? No, no. So they said, we're going to talk to your father. You can talk to anybody you want. Mother, uh, I'm not giving a speech. So they went down to the beauty salon and they talked to my father. And my father backed me up. He said, he, he believed in me that they must have done that intentionally. And he said, uh, if he's not going to give a speech, he's not going to give it. So then they went back and they adjusted the grades again. <laughs> <laughs> and they gave them all the money. <laughs> and I went away to the United States Army. <laughs> um, did you ever, did you feel that you ever experienced overt prejudice when you were running for the various offices in well, the postal union? Our union represented for every city in this country. And there are places in the country where blacks still don't have equal rights. And this is 10 years after I ran for office. So absolutely, there were places. And every member got a vote. So yeah, there were absolutely, there were men. I was the first African American in our union to run for, well, not to run, but to be successful in being a negative vice president and then subsequently president. So yeah, there were, uh, there, there, there were individuals that didn't like me because of the color of my skin and did not want to accept me as president of the union. But there were more uh, that thought otherwise and judged me on my abilities, and that's all I asked. Just my, my ability, my record, what have I done for postal employees? So uh, many more. I never had a post election. I, I stood for election about seven or eight times nationally, and on uh, uh, none of them was I personally. And evidently they thought that I had provided what they expected. Yes, uh, Buster, I want to help you out. Uh, the lady asked what happened to the teachers from Lincoln High School. Uh, they were dispersed throughout the county based on their qualifications, degrees, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Matter of fact, a couple were sent to, not sent, but they attained jobs at college. And I'm speaking of uh, Mr. Shannon. Shooky Shannon. We called him Shooky. I don't know his real name till his name. Oh, uh, okay. But he was in the position in college. He was 
someone else. And of course, along the line of what you're saying, with blacks, uh, I happen to work in the school system in the city of Cleveland, Ohio. When they integrated, they plucked the better teachers from our school and sent them, I hate to say white schools, but they sent them to white schools. You know, and of course, in that you work with a person, you know qualifications. We know who could teach and who shouldn't be there, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, they sent us some lame ducks. <laughs> <laughs> Our school went down, where's the others? What was that integration in that uh, they were balancing the racial mix in the schools? Because I'm in Ohio, and we never had segregated schools in Ohio, as Mr. DeBurris has pointed out. The other schools where I graduated. Okay, well, I'm speaking of Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, we had, when you say segregated schools, we were mixed, but the majority was either Caucasian or black. And of course, the school that I taught at, upon my arrival, it was 80% Caucasian. Within six, seven years, it became predominantly a black school. And of course, with Boston, they wanted to make it 50 50. And that's what they were trying to achieve. I graduated from Wheeling High. When he left Wheeling, I left and went to Wheeling High from Lincoln. All our teachers, they kept Lincoln open, I think, until 56. And that was because the black teachers didn't know where they'd be going or if they had jobs. Some of the students did not feel comfortable going to the three high schools in Wheeling. And so our school board here, I believe, left it so that those uh, choices could be made. So Rose Kenny, Mr. Kenny's daughter, Mr. Kenny was at Clay School when I got my school job with Ohio County. And he was there, I think, right after they closed Lincoln. So they did try to assimilate some of the black teachers that didn't retire or go on to other places. Another problem was a lot of black teachers had two-year degrees and they did not uh, meet the overall qualifications, so they were uh, pushed out of the system. Yeah, I heard that, uh, word of mouth, I heard at one point that there were some, several teachers in Lincoln that didn't, had, didn't get a degree at all. Was there any anything during your term in the union to merge the postal unions? And you think it will ever happen? My constitution, the constitution of my union had a demand that I would reach out to the other unions as president once a year to seek mercy. So our objective, the objective of the American Postal Union, it's in the constitution written there. One union for all postal employees have to try again. Never ever to achieve it. But then, and there's a lot of reasons for that. There's a lot of history in the craft unions. You, you go back two, three hundred years. You know, the, the birthplace of unions was about the occupation. Whatever you did, unions grew up around the function. So a lot of history there. And the other unions have embraced that history. Postal unions, letter carriers, we can go back to the 1800s. And they did not want these. We were the largest unions. They became part of their union, the longest year history would disappear. So uh, the likelihood of the unions, postal union, my union, the American Postal Union, is a result of five unions merging into those pockets. <coughs> we started out as five separate unions that did merge, but the remaining four had no interest whatsoever. And the likelihood that ever occurring in the future is unlikely that they would have given up their union. The mail handlers, a small union, about 50,000 members, they are a part of the Labor's International Union, which is the largest union in this country. And they're owned by laborers. So they couldn't merge without the laborers' consent. That's not going to happen. There's too much money involved there. When you spoke about the apathy of voting, there are cities, states, 
that uh, make it hard now with these uh, new laws. And he asked what one reason why you see the drop in the voting, especially among the blacks. You know, that's not the reason that the reduction in participation is. It's happening, and it should not happen. These voting law limitations, but uh, people are just have to take. You can't bring, you know, difficulty to vote on people that have no difficulty at all that live within a mile of the registration point. Well, that's true. And I mean, just <coughs> don't vote for it. But well, there's cases where some people can. Oh, there's people in the rural parts of the country that do. Ninety-year-old lady. Yeah, they talk about that, and they demand. Uh, driver's license and other things, so that is a lot. Th those are, and we, we, we can overcome those things, and we can bring those things or, or uh, some participation, but the majority, uh, I, I read somewhere where they had an election in Los Angeles, and I think 8% of the population, that was the average of those. Excuse me, but don't you think nowadays, like with the Cook Brothers, I had just read, but then I have it verified, they have almost a billion dollars invested in the next election. Yeah. And this one coming up? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, seriously. Here we are, we work hard. The inequality of wealth. And you like to think you have a vote. Your voice means something. But in this big picture in our country now? Well, the Koch brothers are trying to influence you. They will spend money trying exactly to influence you. If you won't be influenced, then they can spend as much money as they want. Yeah. They can. But you're still a battle of politicians. Well, that's right, because basically. you let the politicians be popular. They don't elect you. No, they don't, but they have to take the same. No. <laughs> I want to make sure people have time to get booked if they want one. So let's have one more question for Mr. Ferris and then we'll. Hello. Uh, yes, ma'am. Did your uh, sister graduate from Bluefield? No, she graduated from Lincoln. She came back to Lincoln for graduation. Well, you said she went to Bluefield College. Oh, 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 I mean the college. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, she didn't graduate. She, my sister got pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> I just wondered if she went on to. And she was there. She provided the opportunity to meet with the people, to get in the post office, and live my career. She provided the foundation there. She's now passed, but she was my, my rock. She was always there for me. So she provided the whole community of Cleveland. So I can start my life. Mm -hmm. well, no, she, she didn't graduate.